the next speaker is uh, Sebastian Zell, and he was going to talk about quantum breaking of the sitter. So I think it starts. Yes, perfect. So stage is yours. Please go. Yeah, um, thanks a lot for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about quantum breaking of the sitter, and that is work with Giat Vali and Cesar Gomez. Um, so what's the starting point? Um, so generally, we believe that the, the any microscopic description of the world is quantum. So then whenever we have a classical solution, um, this is only an approximation uh, to, a, to a fundamental uh, quantum state. So if we have some scalar field phi, um, then we know that um, fundamentally, that's the expectation value over some appropriate quantum state. Um, and so the, the classical solution is only an approximation and the fundamental dynamics is quantum. Um, and then a very natural question that arises is how long is the classical approximation valid? So to, 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 to what point can I, can I use the classical approximation? And at what point will the true quantum evolution fully deviate from the classical solution? Um, and that time scale after which the true quantum dynamics uh, uh, are fully different from the classical solution. That's what we call the quantum break time. Um, and so that is a, a generic statement about quantum systems. Um, and now uh, Gia and Cesar have been asking for some time the question if the same argument can be applied to gravity. So if we have a gravitational solution, if, um, so for a gravitational solution, if fundamentally we should also understand that as um, an approxy, uh, so if, if you should understand that as a multi-graviton state. So then the classical metric would only be an approximation um, and the fundamental dynamics would be in terms of the multi-graviton state. And then in particular, and for this talk, I'm gonna focus on the sitter. Um, and then the, for, for the sitter, the question is, can I view it as the expectation value of a multi-graviton state? Um, and then uh, in the first part of the talk, I will show that the answer is yes. Um, so that in, indeed um, one, one can construct a, a graviton state such that um, the, the, it, 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 its expectation value um, will look like the sitter. Um, and then the same story that, uh, that I told you about before will be true. Um, at some point, the true quantum evolution will deviate from the classical solution. So there will be a quantum break time of the sitter after which the, the classical metric, metric is no longer a good, good approximation for the fundamental quantum dynamics. So that's the first part of the talk. And then in the second part of the talk, I will briefly talk, uh, ask the question if um, the, the, this quantum breaking of the sitter um, may lead to a consistency problem. So if, if that, that uh, may mean that the sitter, so any quantum of the, the description of the sitter leads to an inconsistency. And if that is the case, that has very interesting consequences. Um, so for the first part, um, as I said, I'm, I'm gonna study the sitter. So that, that, that's the space time um, with a fixed Hubble parameter. And as you all know, that leads to an exponential, exponential expansion of space. Um, and is very important for, uh, for our universe because both the early universe, um, we believe, was a quasi-decitter state inflation. And also the, the present dark energy um, will lead to, to a decitter state in the future. Um, and uh, it's also well known that um, there, are, there are problems in the sitter. So for example, um, there's no S matrix due to the lack of a global time. Um, and so, uh, Guy and Cesar have proposed the, the, the new perspective say, um, where the only fundamental metric is Minkowski and any other solution in gravity is an excited state on top of Minkowski. Um, and so for the sitter, th th this means that um, fundamentally it's a multi-graviton state. Um, and so like classically you, you, you see the metric, but then when you look close enough, you will see that it's, it's a collective graviton effect. Um, and then we, we worked out this picture in some technical detail. Um, I'm not going to be technical here, but just uh, give you an overview of, um, of, uh, of the most important parameters. Um, namely, to, to, to get this quantum picture of the sitter, um, the first thing we need is, is an energy scale for the individual particles. Um, and then the, the, just by dimensional analysis, the choice is unique in the sitter. Um, so we, we have the, the Hubble frequency here. And then um, that's the only. And then the only way to generate an energy scale is multiply by h bar. Um, um, then we need some interaction strength um, for the state, 
Um, and then again, in gravity, there's a unique choice. So there should be the Newton constant um, that for dimensional reasons is multiplied by, by Hubble squared. And then we need an H bar to get a dimensionless quantity. Um, next, we need an occupation number for the state. Um, and we, we're going to choose it like this. Um, so one justification is a posteriori that, that it works, um, but it also makes, uh, so the, the, there's a, a short argument to see that it makes sense. Namely, um, we know what the classical energy of the sitter is. So the, just the energy density um, of a cosmological constant. And then we see in the quantum picture that just arises as um, the energy of a single particle multiplied by the number of particles. So that, that is a quick way of seeing why that is the occupation number we should expect. Um, and um, then there's, there's one complication. So um, these, these gravitons um, will feel a strong collective interaction. Um, and so we expect them to be off shell. Um, and so, so to, in particular, they have a dispersion relation that is different from the free, free dispersion relation. Um, and then it turns out um, that one can model this by using a Fields Pauli theory. Um, so uh, just uh, it's very important to say so we're we not using a fundamental graviton mass. Uh, we, we don't think of, of, of massive gravity as uh, with any fundamental meaning. It's just a computational tool of modeling this effect of being off shell. Um, and now with these ingredients, um, we can achieve our goal. So we construct a coherent state. So that is made of so the expectation value of the particle number in the coherent state is given by n. Um, the, each each graviton in the coherent state ha has this mass. Um, and then with this coherent state, we can indeed achieve the goal, namely that the expectation value taken over the coherent state gives um, the, the classical metric. Um, so that was uh, just the first step of, of giving, so, of, um, so, so just by, by, by construction, proving that one can understand the sitter um, as the expectation value of a multigraviton state. Um, now the question is, what is this good for? Um, and uh, to this end, let's look at um, what kind of new quantum effects we get in this picture. Um, and so the, the important one is this one. So we start with the um, coherent state of the n gravitons, and we add some spectator field here. Um, and then uh, a process that can happen is that the two of the gravitons annihilate and produce two of the spectator particles. And the interaction strength is also given by, by the same alpha as before because uh, gravity interacts universally. Um, and now this effect has a twofold meaning. Um, so first we, oh, yeah, let, let's just say we, we, we can estimate the rate um, of this process. Um, so because the amplitude scales with alpha, the rate is alpha squared. And and then alpha squared is the, the rate for two particular gravitons to scatter. And then we have the enhancement due to the degeneracy of the initial state. So there are roughly n pairs of graviton that can do the process. So there's an n squared enhancement. And finally, dimensional analysis tells us that uh, the, the, the only way of, of getting the, the correct dimensionality is, is, is by the Hubble frequency. Um, and of course, the proper calculation will, will agree with that result. Um, and now, um, so the one meaning of this process is from the perspective of the produced particles. Um, so we, uh, namely, um, for an observer that is that that can only see the produced particles, um, this is a production of particles out of the vacuum. So if if the observer thinks of the coherent graviton state just as the metric, then he will say that in this metric there was a particle production. Um, and um, so what, what we're seeing here is a quantum picture of the Gibbons Hawking particle production. So, um, so we, we know that in, in, in the Zeta, it, it has been predicted long ago that there should be, a, so in the semi classical approximation, should, there should be particle production. Um, and now this is a, is a quantum interpretation of that particle production. Um, we can compute the power, so the energy per time, that's just given by the energy of a graviton uh, times the rate of the process. And we see that we get, a, we get h bar Hubble squared in agreement with, with the Gibbons Hawking result. Um, and it's important to say that, of course, our interpretation is very different here. So for us, it's not a vacuum process, but it's an ordinary scattering. So it's just um, some particles uh, convert to some other particles. So that was from the perspective of the produced particles. Um, now let's go to um, the perspective of, uh, of, of the, the sitter state. Um, so we see that um, the, the, this process changes the sitter state. 
So we have um, n particles in the beginning and only n minus two in the end. And then of course, if it's just one process, then it's, it's, a, it's a small effect because n is very large. Um, but then we can ask the question at what point will the effect become large? So how many of these scatterings do I need um, till this, this graviton state has changed significantly? Um, and then of course the answer is on the order of n scatterings um, to, uh, to, to significantly, significantly change the graviton state. Um, and so the time scale to significantly change it is given by n times the time scale of a single process. Um, and then we can plug in to get one over h bar uh, g newton Hubble cube. Um, and then th this is the quantum break time. So that is the time scale after which um, the, the quantum state has fully deviated from the classical solution. So, so classic is a, yeah, I mean, the, the gra graviton state with the n gravitons that the, um, gives us the classical de Sitter solution. And after this time scale, the graviton state has fully changed. And so we will fully deviate from the classical de Sitter solution. Um, let's briefly discuss how we can get um, so, so how we can get the known results. So how we take the semi-classical limit in this picture. So namely the semi-classical calculation, as you know, is done with quantum fields on top of a fixed metric. Um, and then the question is, um, what, what, what kind of limit do I have to take such that um, I can consistently treat the metric as fixed? Um, and there's a unique limit to do that, um, uh, namely the semi-classical limit um, that um, we get by sending the Newton's constant to zero while keeping the classical uh, Hubble frequency and H bar fixed. Um, and in this limit, um, we, uh, the, 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 the power of previous particles, so the, the gibbons hawking particle production is not affected um, and stays finite. Um, but the quantum break time, so the time scale after which the classical solution, uh, the Sitter solution is no longer valid and will go to infinity. And so that, that means um, it's consistent to treat the, the, the classical metric as fixed and it will, that, that, that will be valid forever. Um, how can that be? So, so what is the physical interpretation? Um, uh, it's very easy. Um, so it's just that the classical energy um, that we give to the state is infinite. So we, we, we attribute an infinite energy to the metric. Um, and in that way, it can produce um, particles for an infinite amount of time without feeling any back correction. So that's how we recover the, the semi-classical result. Um, but now um, let's keep all parameters finite. Let's not, not take a limit. Um, and then we see that with the finite h bar and g newton and the, the power of produced particles is finite, but also the quantum break time, so the time scale after the, which the de Sitter solution will stop to be valid. Um, and um, of course, the one interpretation is in terms of back reaction. <laughs> so every particle production destroys some of the de Sitter gravitons, and at some point, a significant number of them has been destroyed, and so the state will deviate significantly. Um, from the initial decider solution. Um, and so as I said, that means we deviate from the classical metric um, and we, we don't have a precise statement on what the final state is, but um, the, the only thing we're, we're sure about is that it's not classical. So it's, uh, it's surely not the initial classical decider state. Um, and there's also no reason to assume that some, some decider state with, with a changed uh, value of the cosmological constant can describe it. Um, so uh, that's, I think, the, the most important point of the talk, um, that once we treat um, the sitter as a quantum state and we get the finite quantum break time after which the classical metric um, is, uh, so after which the true quantum evolution deviates fully from the classical metric. Um, so one immediate uh, implication of that is for inflation. Um, so. Uh, uh, as you know, there's, uh, there, there's, uh, there are good indications that um, the, the early universe saw a phase of inflation. Um, and, it's, and, and all inflationary observables that we compute, we compute in the semi-classical approximation. So we compute as, as quantum effects on top of a metric. Um, and um, this computation seems to agree well with the observations that we have. Um, so that's a very good reason to assume that during inflation, the semi-classical picture should be valid. And um, that means there should have been no quantum breaking during inflation. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, 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 the quantum breaking is um, sensitive to, to the whole um, duration of inflation. So um, 
the total duration of inflation should be shorter than the quantum break time. Um, and then we can plug in and, and write it as a condition on the potential. And um, so the condition is that the first derivative must be bigger than some lower bound. Um, this lower bound here is the gravitational coupling of the gravitons. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm plugging in here. So the square root of h bar g Newton Hubble squared. Um, and um, so this is a fairly mild bound. So, so um, in particular, um, so it excludes the regime, regime of self-reproduction. But as long as your model does not do self-reproduction, um, this, this bound will be fulfilled. Um, and uh, just to comment, so, um, so here it's written in a form so that you can compare it to the, the, the condition from the string theory conjecture, so from the swampland. Um, and then the, so the, from the swampland, you get a much stronger condition. So there you have an order one factor here. And so that, that will, will give a much stronger bound. And our bound is milder. Um, and finally, um, so we, we saw um, that because semi-classical predictions um, uh, seem to describe our universe well, that there should not have been quantum breaking during inflation. Um, but still, there will be some deviation from the classical metric. So just for any, so even if for a time scale shorter than the quantum break time, there will be some deviation from the classical metric. Um, and this effect is just cumulative. So the longer you are in a quasi-decitter state, the more you will deviate from the classical metric. Um, and so this gives um, an, so this leads to um, observables that are sensitive not only to the last 60 e foldings of inflation, but to the whole inflationary history. Um, okay, so th that was the first part of the talk, um, where we saw that we can understand the sitter as an excited graviton state on Minkowski. Um, this leads to the quantum break time, after which the description in terms of the classical metric breaks down. Um, and then that. Um, as an example, we saw that this leads to constraints on inflationary models. Um, now let's go one step further and discuss the consistency of the sitter. Um, namely, um, there are two logical options after quantum breaking. Um, one is that uh, the, the classical approximation is replaced by some non-classical description. So that the, the, so you need to evaluate the true quantum evolution to see what where your state goes, but um, other than that, um, so you, you just replace the classical description by something non-classical, um, but that, that is, uh, you get something consistent. Um, that's the, the option that we, we've had in mind so in the first part of the talk. Um, but the second logical option is that um, the quantum breaking is a signal of an inconsistency of the setup. How to get such a statement? Why would one think that? Um, well, um, what is special about the sitter is that it's sourced by a theory parameter. Um, so that uh, the, the, the uh, so in, your, in the gravitational action, the, the, the cosmological constant is a part of the, the definition of the theory. Uh, and so on the one hand, you have the theory parameter that, that, that is fixed. And on the other hand, you have an evolving quantum state that after some time scale will fully deviate from the initial state. Um, and then we can take this conflict as an indication that for the special case of the sitter, the quantum breaking may indeed lead to an inconsistency. Um, so and let, let me emphasize, so that is really um, only for the sitter. So for a black hole, you would not ask such a question because one and the same theory supports black hole states of all masses. But the special thing of the, about the sitter is that one theory only supports one particular the sitter state. Um, and so that, that is an indication that the, the, the quantum breaking may signal an inconsistency of the sitter. So of course that deserves further investigation. Um, but for the rest of the talk, um, let me just explore what that would imply. So let's just, just do the logical implication and say, what if the sitter is inconsistent um, and see that this has very interesting consequences. Um, so namely, genetically, if the sitter uh, leads to an inconsistency, that gives us the quantum breaking bound um, that tells us that any consistent theory must exit a quasi de sitter state and before quantum breaking can take place. Um, one particular consequence is that you cannot have the sitter vacuum, so, so the sitter minima in the potential from which you, you will never exit. Um, and alone, so, so already the exclusion of the sitter vacuum alone, so this condition alone leads to very interesting consequences. Um, 
So for the present dark energy, it means that it cannot be a constant, but, but it must be an, an evolving field. Um, it's a very mild constraint here because the, the present dark energy is, is small. And so the quantum break time is very long. And so the time scale on which it must change is very long. So it, it may not be observable, this um, deviation from, from being constant. Um, and then there are many more uh, implications. Uh, so for example, um, spontaneous so theories, so extensions of the standard model um, with uh, spontaneously broken discrete symmetries are excluded. And uh, now to, to connect to the first part of the talk, uh, the first talk um, today, um, the existence of a QCD axiom becomes mandatory. Um, and for this argument, um, for th this consequence, I, I will um, present to, to you the argument how it, how it goes. Um, namely, um, let's consider QCD uh, without an axiom. And then we know that in QCD, the vacuum is not unique, but there's uh, different choices of vacua. And um, one can parameterize the choice of vacuum by the theta angle. Um, and um, we know that the theta angle is observable in, uh, in, in form of CP violation in, in QCD. Um, and we know that the, uh, the, the energy of the vacuum is different. So that depending on the value of theta, the vacuum have different energies. Um, the minimum is given at theta equals zero. Um, and the maximum, uh, the, the, the energy of the, the, the maximal energy of the vacuum is given by the QCD scale. So around the 100 MeV. Um, so this is the theoretical knowledge we have about the QCD vacuum structure. Now let's combine it with the observations that we have. Um, namely, we know that theta is very small. So as, as Miguel said, of course, so it's around 10 to the minus 10. And we also know that all contributions to the vacuum energy happen to add up to the present uh, dark energy. So we're not touching the cosmological constant problem here, but we're just using the input that, that um, indeed the zero scale on this, this, this energy axis is set here. And so we know that the present universe is here with a very small theta angle and a very small energy density, so small compared to the QCD scale. Um, and so we know that we have one of these vacua here. Um, and then you see the immediate problem, um, namely the theory supports other vacuum that have a much larger energy, energy density. And then of course, these vacuum are the sitter vacuum. So, so, if, uh, so if, if that, uh, so for, for someone in this state, um, you see a, 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 a vacuum energy on the order of the QCD scale. And, and so this is a de Sitter vacuum. Um, and then if the Sitter vacuum are inconsistent, um, this means that the existence of theta vacuum is an inconsistency. Um, and so in this picture, the, um, the, the strong CP problem is no longer a question about naturalness, but it's a question about consistency. Um, so maybe if a consistent theory cannot have the zeta vacuum, then um, we cannot have the theta vacuum. Um, and then the only way out is to, is to make uh, the theta unphysical. Um, and so that is to introduce an axiom. Um, and so that, uh, so this is a very new perspective on the axiom where, where you don't talk about naturalness, but it just arises um, from a consistency condition of, av of avoiding the sitter states. Um, and as a side remark for, for, for Miguel's talk, um, this also answers the quality problem. So kind of gear, um, proposed a fourth way, and now let, let me talk about a fifth way of addressing the quality problem. Um, namely, if you would break, um, so if you were to break um, the global symmetry, um, then uh, a, a similar argument would apply. So you would, would see that um, the observations would tell you that, that we live in a vacuum of small theta, um, but then because the symmetry is broken, the other vacuum have a larger energy density. Um, and again, by consistency, you cannot have a large breaking of, of, the, of, of the Petri Quinn symmetry. Um, let me summarize. Um, we have seen that um, the sitter uh, can be seen as a, as a multi-graviton state on Minkowski, and that uh, helps to solve some of the uh, known issues that we have with the sitter. So on, of course, then we have an S matrix because we are working on Minkowski. Um, and then in this picture, um, a finite quantum break time arises, namely given by here 1 over h bar g Newton uh, Hubble cube. Um, and after this time scale, um, the true quantum evolution will fully, fully deviate from the classical desitter solution and uh, the uh, description in terms of classical GR breaks down. That was the first part. And then the second part, we saw that um, 
for the sitter, um, the quantum breaking may signal a fundamental inconsistency. Um, and then if that is the case, that has very interesting uh, implications, um, for example, for model, model building. Um, so we saw that the, the existence of an axiom becomes mandatory. Um, finally, let me give an outlook to more recent work. Um, namely, one can arrive at similar conclusions from a very different starting point. Um, namely by studying um, the capacity of, of a state to store memory. So just very briefly. Um, so, uh, I mean, so far we argued in terms of the geometry of the sitter, but the second remarkable property of the sitter is its, uh, is its large entropy. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, so it uh, saturates the Bekenstein bound on, on information storage. And then we, we've been studying um, the sitter from that perspective where we say, let me just use this uh, large entropy as a key feature. And then we saw that um, the stored information will back react on the evolution. And then because of the large amount of stored information, we arrive at the same quantum break time after which the semi-classical description breaks down. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sebastian. Thanks for a nice talk. So questions? So you can speak up directly. I can start with one question, maybe. So, uh, and the question is about the last part of the talk, so the strong CP problem. Now, my question is the following. If the strong CP problem is, in reality, a consistency problem of gravity, should one not expect that gravity itself should provide an axiom from your friend of argument? And if so, uh, any hint about it? Um, yeah. <clears throat> not expect an external ingredient to solve a consistency problem. We expect the theory itself, or at least a consistent version of the theory itself, to solve a consistency problem. I don't know if I explain myself. So. Um, I, I, I fully see the point. That, that's a very good comment. Um, so for me, that, that's not obvious. So um, Cesar wrote a few papers on that. So, so he, he proposed something in that direction of, of, of getting the axiom from gravity itself. Um, so personally, I'm, so I, I, for, for me, it's not obvious how you get it. So I, I, I share your intuition, but I, I don't see how. OK, thanks. Uh, questions? I have a small question. Uh, yeah. The fact that, uh, in reality, the axion even in the standard model doesn't really relax in zero, the theta, but uh, has a small uh, displacement. D does this argument uh, infiate any of the, your conclusions? Uh, about so are you referring to, like, uh, Miguel's talk about the, the explicit breaking? Or... No, no, I have in mind the CP, so I have exact uh, Pechelvin symmetry, but uh, some source of CP violation in the UV, be it uh, CKM or even new physics. We know that the axion, even with exact Pechelvin, doesn't uh, uh, relax to zero, but it has a small uh, displacement. And uh, Do we know that? I mean, of course, there are these contributions, but do you know that they don't go to, uh, like, fine-tune to zero? They're different from zero. I mean, they, this is, um, I think, well, um, there's, there should be no doubt about that. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe it doesn't affect your argument, but... Uh, I mean, there's two points. So for, for me, it's perfectly consistent that you get exact zero. So, of course, there are all the contributions, but may, maybe, I mean, since it's about fine-tuning, maybe they fine-tune to zero. So I'm, I, I don't know any argument telling me that it cannot be zero. Um, one and, and the second one, um, we, we always have the wiggle room of the present dark energy. So we know that uh, there, there's a small uh, dark energy that, that we have at the moment, um, and that, by the same consistency argument, must must relax to zero by some mechanism. And then in this uh, this window of the present dark, so as long as then the, the the explicit breaking contribution is smaller than the present dark energy, that that may work. I think the question was about uh, the value of the axiom, not about the energy. That, that's what you're asking, right? Yes, the the the, the web of the axiom. Sure. Yes, the web yeah. of the axiom. What you mean? What you, what you neutralize is the is theta bar. So you neutralize theta bar, whatever it is. All the contributions taken together. So the axiom neutralizes it. Uh, but the consistency is not that axiom has zero. But the consistency is that there should be a unique vacuum and that unique vacuum should be on Minkowski and that's it. So that, that's perfectly fine. 
So in other words, this argument is perfectly fine with arbitrary amount of CP violation in the standard model. As long as you have unique vacuum, uh, I mean, with continuously they generate unique vacuum, um, which then, then overall it has to be on zero by consistency. So that's okay that you have CP violation, additional CP violation that doesn't change the argument. Okay, thanks. Yeah, essentially the, the, the question here is that you just need something that breaks the super selection rules between the different theta aqua. Exactly, it. yes. That's it. I mean, like, uh, exactly. That's yeah. right. So more questions? Maybe I can ask Sebastian because I, I, maybe I misunderstood what he meant at the beginning, but because you, so when you said that systems, I mean, there, there are plenty of systems in nature which do not quantum break fully. So, so the, I mean, they, I mean, all, yeah. all the systems, they depart from, there's always some departure from classical evolution, but most of the systems for most of the systems, this departure, this departure is not important. Let me make a more precise statement. So um, here, the crucial thing is that the sitter systems like the sitter are they are saturated systems. So it's it's crucial that alpha n is one. Alpha n is order one. The, the way I would say it is that most systems have a classical evolution, and then the classical state will will change before um, the the quantum effect can become large. Right. The special thing about the sitter is that it has no classical evolution. So in a, in a classical theory, it's eternal. And the only thing that can lead to a deviation is the quantum effect. And that's why um, the, nothing, like there's no classical evolution that can save it from, from accumulating the quantum Right, that's, that is the thing, yeah. I, I have a question now. It's related to what he asked, basically. Now, essentially, the essence of your argument is that a in the presence of interactions, a coherent state tends to not stay coherent. So it will experience, experience the coherence. Uh, and this is a well-known problem in, for people that try to build a quantum computer, basically. Right? They, yeah. you, you don't manage to, to keep coherence for long. But there, in quantum information, there are solutions or partial solutions that try to address this problem. Is it possible? I mean, is it completely sure that something analogous to those techniques does not happen here? So that you have an interacting system that is capable of maintaining coherences for long, arbitrarily long. Have you thought about it? I don't know. I know it's different field. To, to my understanding, the, so what you're referring to is the error correcting codes. For instance. Um, so where you always have some redundancy. So you, you, you have a system that is bigger than the information that you want to store. And then it's stored in, in several degrees of freedom. And that's how you can correct for errors. Um, so for, for gravity, that would really mean that you have, so, so that the, the sitter state grows a lot. So that um, you, you have several, you, you must, in some sense, you must have several copies of that um, to, to, to be able to do something like that. Um, and then, for example, from a from an energy point of view, that that would be very hard to imagine. So, um, since since gravity is, is of course sensitive to the total energy, so it, it would seem that implementing something like this would require an energy much larger than the energy of the sitter. Okay. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I, <laughs> sorry, I have to I have to interfere a little bit in this. Maybe it's, if it's okay, um, because um, sometimes this there is a mix of terminology. Uh, when we say, in, in quant for instance, in quantum system, let's say I have a qubit, right? And I want to store information in superposition, let's say. So I prepare it in, in a state, in some entangled state, let's say, or two qubits. Now there, the problem is that I want to keep this entanglement for a very long time. And it's very fragile because it interacts with the environment. And so in a sense there, the problem is opposite. That this, I have this entanglement and the, the interaction with the environment collapses it to something. And, and indeed, most of these classical systems, they, this is, for instance, if I, if I take a bucket of water and I put it in the vacuum, bucket of water is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So the wave bucket will spread. If I wait exponentially long time, the, wave, the bucket of water, which is classical, will evolve into superposition of many buckets of water and it will become quantum. Now, the reason why you don't call this quantum breaking because an arbitrary small perturbation, like it's enough to look at it, at this bucket, 
and you will classicalize the game. And so it's very fragile. Now, what happens in saturated systems like, 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 uh, like uh, the sitter is that the sitter evolves into an exponentially large number of, uh, into a superposition of exponentially large number of states. And uh, so it becomes, uh, becomes fully entangled internally. So not only that it loses constituents, it becomes fully entangled. And unlike all the bucket of water, it's extremely hard to bring it back into out of that state because it's a, it's a superposition of exponentially large number of extremely weakly coupled uh, states because gravitational coupling is very small. And so, so that's what happens there. And so that's quantum breaking is the- So is the, that there is no wave bucket uh, reduction. Exactly, that's right. That's exactly the point. And so that's why you need what uh, Sebastian said, the classical evolution of the source to keep, redu to keep reducing wave packets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry to in yeah, okay. interfere. Any more questions? Well, if not, I think we can thank Sebastian again and also- Yes, uh, maybe one question? Yes, please. Uh, there was this parallel with a, a quantum system in the lab. In that case, the decoherence is due to interaction with the environment. But here, what is uh, what would be the environment? Because you just have the sitter system in that all. So I, I mean, as Gia said, it's it's kind of the opposite here. So it's it's like the creation of entanglement, not the destruction of entanglement. But um, the of course there there must be some interaction. So I mean, in the in the toy model that, that I showed, it's just an external field um, to which uh, the, the gravitons talk, and also the gravitons themselves would do the job, of course. So just because th there is some interaction among the gravitons of the state, um, at some point the coherent state will will stop being coherent. So you assume that the self interaction between the gravitons destroys the coherence coherence of the current state. Yeah, so that, that, that self interaction is strong enough to, to give the quantum breakdown. And of course, you cannot turn it off. I mean, the, the gravitons do interact. But... The sitter does not exist without the self interaction. But how do you know that? Uh, how can you be sure that uh, this, uh, uh, this coupling, this, this, the coherence, coherence of this current state, is not like a, a, a scientific state of, uh, or a um, an attractor regime uh, in presence of this coupling, self coupling. That the, in spite of the existence of this coupling, the coherence is self maintained. How, how can you be sure that the, the coupling will destroy the coherence of the system? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, of course, you're saying that there could be some miracle that of like the, that the graviton comes back into the state and then after after the scatterings the, um, the the final state is like the initial state, but then I mean that is exponentially improbable. I mean, there's there's all possible final states, and then that you will uh, will, will end up with the initial state is, is exponentially improbable. I see. Is that an Thank issue? Thank you. In time. Sorry. Is there an issue with recurring time, recurrence time? Um, so the recurrence time is, is much longer than the quantum break time. And so that in, in our picture, there's there's no issue anymore. Okay, okay. More questions? Well, if not, we can now thank Sebastian and Miguel again. Thanks for the nice talks and see you for next time. Bye. Thanks a lot for coming. Bye. Thank you.